Thank you, Doris. Good evening. Welcome to worship on this, I guess, would be Pentecost Eve, where we'll celebrate the gift of the uh, Holy Spirit. Pastor Scott will be uh, home later this evening uh, since there was a new bishop, and if the new bishop is a Reverend Scott Johnson, and he's currently serving as chaplain at Midland University or at Midland College. And uh, but they wanted all the pastors that said you will stay and attend the church service. So, <laughs> Pastor Scott <laughs> said there's no sneaking out of this one. So, you got me. <laughs> we'll have a couple of uh, very short temple talks at the end of the service uh, with the announcements. And for now, we'll begin and prepare our hearts and minds for worship. And if you would like to follow along on page 97 in the red hymnal. And we begin in the loving name of God the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God. For in the beginning, your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word, you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood, you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea, you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word, you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs to your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you, you be given the honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We'll now have our gathering hymn. It is number 800, and it's in the red hymnal. Let us sing verses 1 and 2. Verses 1 and 2. May the Lord be with you. Let us pray. God, our creator, the resurrection of your son offers life to all the peoples of the earth. By your Holy Spirit, kindle in us the fire of your love, empowering our lives for service and our tongues for praise. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
And we'll have John Mark with read some scriptures. The reading is from Acts 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, ah, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be God, it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out, out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello, and welcome to our celebration of Pentecost. Do you remember what that word means? We talk about it every year at about this time. Well, I'm gonna read a story from the book of Acts that's gonna tell us what Pentecost is all about. When the Feast of Pentecost came, they, and that's all of Jesus' followers, were all together in one place. Without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind, gale force. No one could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building. And then, like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread through their ranks, and they started speaking in a number of different languages as the Spirit prompted them. There were many Jews staying in Jerusalem just then, devout pilgrims from all over the world. When they heard the sound, they came on the run, then when they heard one after another, their own mother tongues or their native tongues being spoken, they were thunderstruck. They couldn't for the life of them figure out what was going on. And they kept saying, aren't these all Galileans? 
How come we're hearing them talk in our various mother tongues? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites? Visitors from Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia? Pontus in Asia? Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, immigrants from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, even Cretans and Arabs. They're speaking our languages, describing God's mighty works. Their heads were spinning. They could not make head or tail of any of it. They talked back and forth confused. What is going on here? Well, we now know that that was Pentecost, and we celebrate that day when God sent the Holy Spirit to all of us and to all of his people. It burst into the church with mighty gusts of wind and tongues of fire. So they were all there together, and then there was a flame dancing above each person's head. What would you think if a big, huge gust of wind, like those really windy days we have, blew through us, and then you suddenly saw these bright flames dancing above each of our heads. That's kind of hard to imagine, right? Surprising. But that is how God works. He is always surprising us. Remember last week, we talked about Paul and Silas in prison, and God surprised them with an earthquake. And then they surprised the jailer by singing and praying while they were in prison. On Pentecost, God's people were surprised again with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in their native language. So what that would look like now is if pretend we're at church in Blair, and maybe we have some visitors from different countries today. So there's one person there from Japan, and there's another person there from Tanzania in Africa, and maybe there's another person there from the Netherlands. And all of the sudden, they all start speaking in their own language. So that first person is speaking in Japanese and I'm speaking in English. And the other person is speaking in Swahili, one of the languages in Tanzania. And then the person from the Netherlands is speaking in Dutch. Crazy, right? But here's the craziest part all of us would know what each other was saying, even though we were hearing it in different ways. So if I said, Christo te ama, do you know what I said? How about, Yesu I ni? Do you know what that means? Jesus liebt dich. All three of those things I just said were the words, Jesus loves you. The first was in Spanish, Cristo te ama. The second one was in Chinese, Jesu I ni. And the last one was in German, Jesus liebt dich. All of those mean the same thing. And if it was at Pentecost, that time with God's spirit, we would be saying them all in different ways, but hearing the same thing, Jesus loves you awesome right so now what what does all this mean for us here in Blair or online wherever you are what does this mean this means that we need to go out and spread Jesus love with everyone too and we need to tell others about that Holy Spirit about that feeling that ha you have inside that you're safe and that feeling that you are loved and that Jesus is with you even though you can't see him it's like a fire in our hearts, that fire dancing above their heads. And we can share that fire and that love. So let's pray. Dear Father God, thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to your people, to us. Help us remember it is there to guide us, to teach us and to care for us. Thank you for the flames in our hearts and the love we can share. You are a God of surprises and we love that. Help us continue to look for your presence in our lives, even in the surprises, and help us share your love. We love you most, God. Amen. All right, go out there and spread that fire, that fire inside your heart, that Holy Spirit, and tell everybody that Jesus loves them, no matter what language they speak. I'll see you soon.
Now, if you would, please stand as you are able for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel, according to John, 14th chapter, verses 8 through 17, and 25 through 27. Glory to you, O Lord. Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time? Philip, and you still do not know me? Uh, you do not believe that the Father and the Father is in me. The words that I say to you do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Believe me that I am the Father and the Father is in me. If you do not, then believe in me because works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the fact that the greater of these works because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. In my name, if you ask me for anything, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I have said these things to you while I am still with you because the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. This ends the reading of the gospel. Please be seated. Gosh, for a minute there, I kind of panicked. I thought maybe I'd gotten a hold of last week's gospel by mistake, but everything was good. So. <laughs> You know, sometimes words and phrases in the Bible, they just leap out at you. I know this happens to me. This was certainly true in this gospel for the Pentecost Sunday, which is some call the birth of the church. Depends on which theologian. I was struck by Jesus' statement that his followers will do greater works than he did. His assurance that he will do whatever we ask in his name caught me by surprise. Finally, I was overwhelmed that with Jesus' promise to send the Spirit who will be our counsel and never leave us. These are powerful and transforming words. I mean, who can do things greater than Jesus? I've never known anyone who could walk on water or still a storm or feed 5,000 people. There are some ladies in our church, though, that I carry uh, go visit that are over 90, and I think they could still pull off feeding, oh, maybe 2,500. <laughs> How can we do anything any greater than what Jesus did do or could do? What Jesus wanted to do was assure his followers that they will receive the same Holy Spirit that Jesus had in his ministry. Theologians do agree that it was not Jesus' innate power that enabled him to do what he did. He gave up that power when he emptied himself and became totally human. Instead, it was the power of the Holy Spirit that flowed through Jesus and accomplished those tasks. Jesus received that spirit at the beginning of his ministry. It doesn't make sense to believe, as some do, that things are greater than Jesus talks about here. In our, well, let's say just our own personal accomplishments. The Christians in our, in our society, we kind of get obsessed and we've kind of fallen into that temptation of believing that the Holy Spirit will empower them maybe to get great success or they'll get millions at an early age and enable their company to reach high gains and purchase big houses and 
more toys, everybody wants more toys. But in our narcissistic culture, it's all too tempting to believe that we have a spirit for affluence and comfort. Clearly, this is not what Jesus had in mind. The greater works that Jesus was referring to was the greater in the area of ministry that his disciples were taking up. As they proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ, they cast out demons, they healed the sick, and they called on people for repentance and to strengthen their faith. That way they could do things greater than Jesus. The greatness would not come from more power, but from the fact that the disciples would be more than one person. They would be a community of believers, just as we are a community and a family here at First Lutheran Church. We can accomplish more things together. Christians have often misunderstood that guarantee that Jesus gave his followers. They feel that Jesus' words assure them that their prayers to win the lottery or pass the test for which they haven't studied, wipe away the results of their sinful behavior, or I know mostly when I was a younger man, I'd get myself in a jam and, Oh, Lord, if I, you get me out of this, I'll go to church eight days a week and I'll never do this again. This isn't what Jesus meant. Jesus said that whatever we prayed in his name would be answered. This calls for us to do more than end our prayers with that magic phrase, in Jesus' name. This phrase means in Jesus' will. We are challenged in our prayer life, not to pray for our will, but to pray that God's will will be done in our lives and in our world. Prayer changes our focus of our lives off of ourselves and on to God. Prayer does not perceive God to be our personal errand boy who has nothing better to do than make sure our every whim is met. Prayer joins together with God to accomplish God's will and to bring God's kingdom into our lives and into our world. Now as we go through life, Jesus assures us that we will never be alone. Jesus will be with us in the person of the Holy Spirit. Certainly God will be with us in the trials and tribulations of our lives and he will never forsake us. This promise goes further than that However, it's a promise that God will always be with us if we act faithfully, obediently, and boldly in the service of God and our fellow human beings. The Holy Spirit is our counselor. The Spirit will guide us, empower us, help us, and change us into God's image. The life in the Spirit that Jesus is talking about in this passage is much bigger than the American vision of success. In fact, it could be quite the opposite of that vision. Jesus is talking about dying to live for ourselves and living to live for God. When we do this, the Spirit will move in our lives in a manner that is beyond any of our comprehensions or our imaginations. Amen. Amen. We'll take a few moments for personal examination. Mighty God, you breathe the life into our bones and your spirit brings truth to the world. 
Send us the Spirit, transform us by your truth, and give us language to proclaim your gospel through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our hymn of the day is on page 398 in the red hymnal, 398. Let's sing verses 1, 2, and 3. 1, 2, and 3. Join me in confessing our beliefs in the words of the Nicene Creed, which is found on page 104 in your red hymnal. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, being of one with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in the glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who is spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now as we prepare our hearts for the prayers of the community, I ask you that when I pray, God, in your mercy, please answer, hear our prayer. Set free from captivity to sin and death, we pray to the God of resurrection for the church, people in need, and all of creation. Holy living one, holy moving one, Burst open our locked doors, and by your Spirit, drive us out of the world, proclaiming your mighty deeds. Direct our words and actions, trusting the Advocate abiding in and among us. God, in your mercy. Feed and care for creatures that remain hidden to us, yet contribute to the vibrancy of your creation. Train us to interact with creation from a place of wonder, awe, and reverence. God, in your mercy. 
Comfort all those who live in constant fear and any who are suffering. Remind them that your spirit has made them your children and that they are never far from your glory. God, in your mercy. Guide all bishops, pastors, missionaries, and other ministers of the gospel. Foster our relationships with partner synods and local ministry partners, that our visions and actions are spirit-led. God, in your mercy. Gather your people across regions, nations, and lands. Root out common life in the life, in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And by your spirit, bind us together with all the saints who have gone before us. God, in your mercy. In your mercy, O God, respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving spirit through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And John, Mark, would you bring the offering forward, please? Let us pray. Living God, you gather the wolf and the lamb to feed together in your peaceable reign, and you welcome us all at your table. Reach out to us through this meal and show us that your wounded and risen body, that we may be nourished and believe in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now we prepare our hearts and minds for Holy Communion. I bring you peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. When our congregation gathered for the celebration of Holy Communion, we heard again the story of God's mighty acts and of the love shown to us in the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. With thanksgiving, we remembered that in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. We were given assurance of our Lord's presence through the gift of his Holy Spirit. And now we bring you this same bread of life and this same cup of blessing that you may be strengthened through your participation in the body of Christ. Now together, let's pray the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
Almighty God, you provide the true bread from heaven, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Grant that we who have received the sacrament of his body and blood may abide in him and he in us, that we may be filled with the power of his endless life, now and forever. Amen. We have uh, at this time just a a few announcements, and I think we're going to start with John Mark. He's going to come up and uh, speak to us a little bit. I have two brief messages. The first one is from the Vision Task Force, and as many of you know, you have received questionnaires through emails. The Vision Task Force is putting together a questionnaire trying to develop information about the church and about how we can more effectively do ministry here. There are questionnaires available that you can fill out in the visiting center, in the visit center there at the main desk, and there is a basket should you choose to to do a written questionnaire. Otherwise, of course, you may also fill out the questionnaire online. I do want to, as as a member of the Vision Task Force, assure you as members of the congregation that it is not the vision task force's responsibility to develop the vision. That's going to be the congregation, that's going to be the church council, that's going to be the staff. But we are tasked with putting together information about the church and how we might more effectively do ministry here at First Lutheran. So that's the first message that, that I'm charged to bring. And then the second one is that, again, this is our annual uh, offering of letters sponsored by Bread for the World. This always is an important one to me, in part because one of the founders of Bread for the World went to Dana College, Art Simon, and uh, it was through his ministry and his work that Bread for the World came into existence. This year, we're offering letters to our Nebraska congressional uh, representatives in support of the Farm Bill, and particularly for for seeing to it that the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program is strengthened. So I invite you to consider signing those letters. There were tables at the back. You can sign here, and then there will be Uh, counted as a part of the uh, congregation's uh, submission to our representatives, or you can take them home with you and send them individually. So we invite you and encourage you to consider signing these letters. And now before we leave, Chris is going to play just a short video about, about Bread for the World. Thank you. Bread for the World is a collective Christian advocacy organization that urges Congress to pass legislation to end hunger and poverty at home and abroad. Hundreds of millions experience hunger and poverty around the globe, and these numbers have grown exponentially since the coronavirus pandemic began. A key advocacy and organizing tool at Bread for the World to fulfill our mission and God's call To End Hunger and Poverty is our offering of letters to Congress. It is an opportunity to put our faith in action, inviting congregations, campuses, or groups to gather together to write personalized letters or emails to Congress to reduce hunger and poverty through legislative action. Over the years, these letters and emails have helped win victories and address hunger issues and their root causes, such as global hunger, our broken immigration and criminal justice systems, and the racial wealth gap. In recent years, these efforts secured passage of the Global Food Security Reauthorization Act, a bill that ensures support for smallholder farmers and addresses the nutrition needs of women and children around the world. 
These efforts also helped pass COVID-19 relief bills to increase the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program by 15% and extend pandemic EBT to provide groceries for children who lost access to free and reduced price lunches due to school closures. These are significant wins when so many Americans struggled to put food on the table. Visit our website, available in English and Spanish, and get the latest tools and tips to plan your event and write Congress to support effective anti-hunger programs and policies around the world. By putting your faith in action, through the offering of letters, you are helping families to put food on the table and ensure our nation and world have access to a healthy, sustainable future. Together, we can end hunger in our lifetime. Thank you. Um, social, social concerns, there I did it. They have asked that we share this prayer together as a body of Christ in support of Bread for the World. Let us pray. God of Shalom, we offer these letters as tokens of our love and stewardship. May each letter be a voice speaking up for all who suffer the ravages of malnutrition, hunger, and war. We speak out for mothers and children, families that experience hunger in the U.S. and globally. We ask that you multiply these letters until our voices swell into one great chorus echoing through the halls of government and throughout the land, calling forth a reordering of priorities in our nation and our world. And moving us closer to your reign of justice and peace, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now receive this blessing. God, the author of life, Christ, the living cornerstone, and the life-giving spirit of adoption bless you now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our sending song today is 400 in our red hymnal. And let's sing verses 1 and 2.